Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here. Recently, I did a Let's Play on Robocop 3 for the Super Nintendo. My friend Jonah at Robocop Archive shared it on his Facebook page, and it was brought to the attention of Bill Harbison, who worked at Ocean Software during the late 80s and mid 90s, and he actually worked as an animator on Robocop 3. I contacted him and he kindly offered to discuss the game and his career at Ocean over Skype. So here is the interview. I hope you all enjoy it and find it informative. Well, the first thing really was I wanted to know, because you, you worked at Ocean uh, during the period when it was made, and I think on the list you sent me of some of your games you worked on for your CV was like Batman and Lethal Weapon and Jurassic Park. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. The first thing I wanted to ask, it's, like, it's, kind, of, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like two questions in one, but how did you get into the industry and how did you end up working at Ocean? Oh, right. Um, well, I actually started there um, in 1988. Um, so I started on the Spectrum in Amstrad. Oh, wow. So I've been, I'd been there for a while at that point. Um, and how I got the job was um, looking through some old uh, computer and video games magazines and looking at screenshots, and I thought, well, somebody must do these graphics. Yeah, you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody must do them. They must that must must be somebody's job. So I'd been putting screenshots together of various pieces of artwork on the spectrum, um, and I had um, done some mock-ups of what some um, arcade machines might look like on the spectrum, and I put them all together on a cassette. Oh wow! And yeah, and um, stuck it in the post. And um, got a, a call to come for an interview, and they pretty much offered me the job there and then on the spot. Oh, that's fantastic! Because I've I've read a lot of like Retro Gamer magazine, and yeah. um, and this, it's kind of like the same similar sort of scenario with many of the sort of programmers and game designers. It was just like sending in like the samples of their work, and boom, they've got a job the next week. And it just sort of the now now it's like a there's so many people trying to get work in that industry and back then well from what I've read it just seems far more far more easier and like there's less competition um, did you was it kind of well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's easier um, not easier back then I think no because the standard of graphics is so high now yeah that it's difficult to get in and I'll, even people that have been at university for years arm at the standard that a games company wants to hire unless it's just for like a, a low paid intern sort of job where they'll they'll learn while they're on the project right i mean the first when you once you started at ocean i mean was it what was the first project you got to work on um well I started on the on on a Monday and then I'd, I'd arrived in the afternoon, so I came in the Tuesday morning and they said, "Right, you're uh, working on Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge." <laughs> oh, fantastic! I had that on the spectrum. Was, was that on the spectrum? That wasn't was it? Was yeah, spectrum yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, bloody hell! So I was like, "Oh, go, right, okay." <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to be working on, and it was like. I've got to do the same old graphics again that's already been done two or three times already. So um, was, it, was it your job to sort of translate it to another platform, like to a Spectrum or to the Amstrad, like just doing a port, as it were? Oh no, I had oh. to design the game from do it from scratch, basically. God, so how, how long did it, how long did they give you to sort of get this done? Was it what was the I schedule? It was, it was quite short. I think it was probably about five months and then maybe another month on top to recall the stuff for the Amstrad. At that point I had never even done animation so I was like shitting myself thinking Oh you must have okay. been. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a big license, it's Daily Thompson, it's got Adidas on it, it's got LucasAid on it, it's going to be it was the year of the Olympics and I was thinking shit Oh. This is this is this is really going to test me here. So that that was my first project. It's, it's, it's quite surprising how the amount of you know responsibility they've given you at sort of, uh, such short notice as well. Yeah, I just walked in off the street and they gave me that. This is what they gave me. Yeah. God, it'd be like someone. No experience. No experience at all. 
<laughs> if you're like someone you know now walking in to, I don't know, into Sega and someone says, okay, you'll be working on Sonic the Hedgehog next week, you'd be like, what? You know, you'd cack your pants, you know. Yeah, you would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, on your on your on your list of you know your CV as it were, uh, you worked on Batman the movie as well. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Was that this for that, this, was um, it, was the this, you Spectrum and Amstrad as well? No, that was the ST and Amiga. Oh wow! My God, that was like the ST and Amiga ones was always like the one I wanted as a kid, but couldn't afford it because I was like I was lumped with the Commodore sixty four. So I, right. I could always, I could never get a chance to own the Amiga at the time. I had previously worked on um, Chase HQ on the Spectrum in Amstrad. Was I'd it, done the graphics for that. Wasn't that? Didn't that? I think didn't Chase HQ get very good reviews? It was, it was highly, quite highly regarded, wasn't it, on the Spectrum? Wasn't it? Or was it number two? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, it depends on your source. I mean, some some people say that it's it's the best arcade conversion on like the spectrum in Amstrad and yeah it, it's usually quite high up in the top 20 of like games of all time it is yeah not, that, not that I've looked or anything <laughs> <laughs> because easy because I said earlier you know my sort of frame of reference in terms of I mean there's things I experienced as a kid you know growing up playing these sort of 8-bit microcomputers and going on to like consoles but looking back now it's sort of what was because some things you just miss or you you know you're not aware of but I guess it's saying with retro gamer I mean some of these games uh, that Ocean produced during this during that period were some of the sort of the best Spectrum games, always in the top ten. Most of their titles were. Um, where you've got things like, for example, the first Robocop game, it's like regarded as one of the best sort of conversions. And some people even say even even better than the arcade the one on the it Spectrum. It was in the charts for over a year. Yeah. Which I couldn't believe. <laughs> you know, it's like it's mental. It's like they, back then, I mean, the games were costing what? What ten pound? Do you think? I think it was. Oh, probably pretty... about six or seven ninety nine, maybe. Yeah, I mean, we sort well, of. when I started around that, and then it started to go up. That's right. Yeah, I mean, when I when I started buying games for the Commodore, I mean, it was sort of fizzling out by that point. It was like ninety, ninety two, ninety three. So it's kind of like maybe, but maybe a couple of years before then, prices were sort of dipped quite sharply. Um, but when it came to sort of you know. Robocop itself, Robocop 3, during that period at Ocean, was there sort of a big change coming about when, when, you start, when, they, when Ocean started working on the 16-bit consoles? Well, I guess so, because it was something different. Um, it was something that we'd not really um, had any experience in at that point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we'd, we'd pretty much done everything on on your Spectrum, your Amstrad, your Commodore 64, and then even going up to the Atari ST and Amiga. Yeah. But when the SNES and the Mega Drive came out and the actual uh, the, the, the developers were coming from all over the world, it wasn't just just us in Europe. It, it, was, um, it was a much bigger area that we were in competition with. That's right, yeah. And... Um, it was quite daunting because it was, yeah, it was going to be quite a, it was going to be a bigger audience and obviously bigger sales. Yeah. But um, it was, it was learning the new machines and um, I think I had just come off doing um, Batman on the ST and Amiga. Yeah. Um, the reason I brought up Chase HQ <laughs> was because I had done the the three D sections of the the Batmobile stuff. Oh, sorry, on the what the Amiga one, sorry, in ST. On the, on, on the ST and Amiga, really? yeah. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Because that, that's like, you know, the big, that was one of the biggest selling points of the game, was those driving well, segments. Well, that, that was the thing at the time, because what they wanted to do was they wanted to combine the two top grossing games, which were Robocop and Chase HQ, into one, which was going to be Batman. So yeah. you had the racing sections at Chase HQ, and you had the running about sections like Batman. Exactly. Yeah, but, but when we got um, so I had just finished that, and it was such a big, important game, and we got loads of stuff from the studio, like we got storyboards, we got the script, we occasionally got pictures, and it was like a big event that this movie was coming out. And no, yeah. when we finished it, and it was out in the shops, it was amazing. And then we got called in for our next project, and it was you know, you're going to be working on Robocop three, and we were like, fuck, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Ocean, Ocean had already done Robocop 2, hadn't they? 
for the yeah, year. I know, I know, but it was a, it was it was because it was Robocop three, and it was based on the movie. It wasn't. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it like the arcade. We couldn't just copy the arcade, which is what I wanted to do, and sort of. Because because Robocop sort of, three itself, I mean, the game. I mean, first time. I mean, when you obviously they announced you doing Robocop three, because you said with Batman, you're given like storyboards and pictures and things like that. But with Robocop three, were you shown uh, like a, a rough cut of the film, or were you just given a nope. script and some stills? I I don't even think we got a script. Uh, we didn't get any stills. I think what we got for Robocop three was a. I think we got a. a it, it wasn't like a full script. I think it was a breakdown, just basically so we could work on um, location. Design. Yeah. So it was like a, a, a series of locations, and that's pretty much all we got. We got like a a synopsis of the. Um, of the plot as as much as there was and <laughs> yeah. um we had to to pretty much make it up on the spot on a machine that we had absolutely no experience of and plus i was working with somebody new at the time who just started he was like a, a, a young programmer um who'd done stuff on probably i think 16 bit like the st and amiga probably and then yeah. he was thrown on, thrown onto the SNES, and I think he found it a bit daunting. So there were a few restrictions that were thrown my way immediately, which I wasn't happy with. Mm. Um, for example, Robocop shooting his gun, and his arm springs out every time he fires his fucking gun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the the explanation I was given for that was because you could only have a certain number of the sprites on a line right which and I thought surely not on the SNES it's not going to start breaking up graphics on the SNES no and then for memory uh, problems there was memory problems as well where uh, the um, we had to do the all the baddies you'll notice that all the baddies are pretty much the same that's right yeah we're very, well, reason, limited, I mean, we're very limited animation. <laughs> for that way. The reason for that <laughs> was because we had to to make it look like there was a bit of variety. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was we just used the same sprays, but we changed the color palette so that they had different colored clothes on. <laughs> it's the red guys and the and the gray guys, isn't it? Yeah, so we were just we were just swapping the palettes of the of the of the graphics, pretty but much. That, but that's what a lot of you know. A lot of games do anyway, you know, it's, it's to compensate for trying to create new characters. And it's and it's it's not obviously apparent with Robocop, it's apparent with many games, wasn't it, at the time. They're just, just you, mm. it's even like Mortal Kombat, you know, you've got Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Ermac, whatever, all these names. But they're all just, it's just palette swaps, aren't they? Yeah, pretty much. But we, did, we had no designs or concept sketches or anything. We were just told to get on with it. So, and we weren't exactly excited about the prospect of working on Robocop 3. Well, because, None of us were. <laughs> did, you, did you think at the time, you know, you guys weren't really interested in working on Robocop 3? Was there sort of a stigma going on saying, you know, you already know the film's bad or like, it was because the film didn't come out till 93 because it got delayed, didn't it? For many years. Um, it was supposed to be out 90, because I've, I've researched the film and done a video on it, but it's kind of like it was supposed to be out ninety one, but it got it got stuck on the shelves for two years and wasn't didn't come out till ninety three. So yeah. for many of us growing up as kids, we we go in the shop and we see Robocop three on the shelves. I'm thinking, well, what? Where's the film? You know, where where's this <laughs> film? It's not even it's not even out yet. Well, I've never heard of this. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that fact at the time. Oh, um, right. I wasn't aware of that. We were just we were just told to get the game finished for a certain time and whether the the film was delayed or not, I don't know because to date I've still not seen it. You still seen um, it? Oh. Even though I, I've got the trilogy on DVD and I refuse to watch it. Bill, you gotta watch I can, it. Just, I can just, just have I can a drink. just about drink watch the second one. I can just about watch the second one. <laughs> but I've never watched the third one. You're gonna have to do it. You're gonna have to bottle it up and just sit down and watch it and go, <laughs> I, What I the don't hell have I, I done? <laughs> <laughs> because because what we did on that game look is probably absolutely nothing like the film whatsoever. There's there's some there's minor sort of you can you can picture bits from it. You know there is clear indication of like 
the level breakdowns and you've you've it's, it's like kind of like a basic interpretation of the film and it and and for fans you know they you can recognize parts but obviously other parts you it's just like what hell? What the hell happened here? But actually, you <laughs> mean and, the giant, the <laughs> giant robot demon? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What, did you design that? Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not proud of it either. It doesn't have any. And, <laughs> oh, I did all the, I did all the sprites, all the animation. So I did RoboCop. I did the bodies. I did all the sort of flying. You know the. What did you call it? The fucking Rocket pack, Red right? Nose Day things and oh, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to be honest, I I didn't put much effort into it myself. You know the designer stuff. Was it like I just wanted it done and get it out of the way? I mean, with with a lot of these ocean games, when they came to a movie license, you know, did did for example, Robocop Three have the least amount of input from the studio and the information you had to go off to develop the game? Um, I'd probably say the first one did. Oh, that had the, the first Robocop. That had, well, had that had the least amount of information to run for. It all the probably most. did, yeah, because when the second one came out, um, I remember uh, getting various bits and pieces through, and, and I remember one very excited day when somebody came up to me and said, "We've just had a fax through of the design for Kane." Oh wow. <laughs> And we're like, what? So we all sort of came round and we saw this robot and we thought, yeah, that looks pretty cool. Oh, yeah, it does. Doesn't it? But the thing is, it actually, in uh, an interview with some people at Ocean, I read on Retro Gamer, they, some of them had said they'd seen a rough cut for Robocop for the first game. Um, someone had said they'd seen like an the extended cut. And obviously on DVD now you get the unrated cut of Robocop where it's far more gruesome than the theatrical cut. So they'd, yeah, they'd yeah. said they'd seen the scenes which weren't on in the theatrical version, so they got to see this unrated cut. So I, so they obviously saw something, but then obviously down the line, there's been less information, you know, I think on. that was probably b before my time anyway, and because yeah. I was, like, not on the project, I wouldn't have got to see it. Oh, that's true, yeah. That's a true. similar thing happened to me with Terminator 2, so I got, I got to see that before it was released, and it was complete and uncut as well. Oh, wow. Because I, I, I got. Oh, could you, did you work? did you work on Terminator Two for the, the Commodore and Amiga versions? Was it? Um, yeah, we we all we all sort of pitched in on on those. So I, I think I did a bit on it, and a few other people sort of done some work on it as well. So that the um, they kept the cinema just for us one afternoon. So there was about twenty of us went and saw this, and we everybody was just blown away by it completely. Oh, surprise! With them, um, obviously we. Or Robocop Three. I mean, obviously down to obviously you worked on all the sprites and, uh, but with the sort of the gameplay elements. I mean, it does borrow, you know, all the platform elements in the game does borrow from the arcade. I mean, you're sort of walking along, aiming up and down, shooting guys in the in the roofs and things like that. Obviously, many gamers had was the frustration of the di the legendary difficulty of the game. Did mm. when it came to sort of testing the game, did you guys find it yourselves? Oh, this difficulty is too high, or did you think? Well, the difficulty's fine. We were okay with it before it was released, or was it not much testing done? You know, as it were. <laughs> this this is kind of like strange for me to talk about, actually, <laughs> <laughs> because the guy who I was originally w working on the game with um, either left or was sacked. Really? Oh wow! The so pro the pro the programmer the programmer so was, was handed sacked. up. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. well, I don't know if he was sacked. He might have just left because he'd had enough. <laughs> um, so it was handed over to another programmer who was a really dear friend of mine and <laughs> sadly no longer with us as of last year. So this is kind of weird to talk about. Oh, God, but must be. he yeah. he was given he was basically given all the code <laughs> to finish it off. Yeah, what <laughs> he was a proper hardcore gamer. Ah. Okay. That there's, there's so the he wasn't. He didn't want the game to be easy. He wanted it to be rock hard to play. <laughs> no, we did have a QA department. Yeah, obviously, none of them could play the game. <laughs> the only person, the, <laughs> the only person that could play the game was Jack, who drew the backgrounds of the game. He was the only one that could play it from start to finish. And pretty much not lose a well, 
without having to start again, just with the lives that he had, he could go from the start of the game to the end. And he was the only one that could do it. What? He, well, he deserves a gold medal. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> he, he deserves the Games Master golden joystick, I think. I think he deserves that. So it was, it was basically based around his ability to play the game because nobody else could. I couldn't even get past the first level. Well, yeah. Oh, could I when I was a kid? I, I tried to do it. I tried and tried and tried. And then I had to get an action replay cartridge. And I had to, and there was an unlimited health code you can only get unlimited ammo and lives and mm. i could get to like the fourth level with the rocket pack and never do it it was impossible it was so hard and well it wasn't until i saw your video <laughs> that i was able to see some of the stuff that i'd drawn on the game ah because i'd never seen it before i'd, no, I'd not seen really? it since i did it oh my yeah God. i'd never seen the levels i'd i'd I was aware of the sort of flying levels, but I'd not actually seen them being played <laughs> since I'd done them. Ah. So it was it was kind of odd seeing all that again. It must have been, yeah. But obviously a big, you know, a big big surprise to you. Did you did you sort of think to yourself, oh, and this this was a bit what made you know for some of the key level designs like with the the flying packs with the sort of red nose day <laughs> rockets, you know? Did you think to yourself, okay? Why did you design it like that? Was there something in your mind think, okay, this is going to be a rocket, or was it just trying to, the perspective of the rocket looked like a red circle? They're, they're mines. Oh, they're mines. <laughs> <laughs> they're not it's, rockets. They look, they look like rockets. They sort of like, when they're animated, they move upwards, and then they shift with the player, so you can't really escape from them. So they yeah, must... Well, well, the, the, the sky mines, for fuck's sake. <laughs> even know that <laughs> well well yeah, yeah but the thing was they were just meant to be red uh we just wanted something that you had to basically avoid or shoot so it was just like there it is avoid <laughs> it or it's gonna <laughs> blow you up but were yeah. you were you because uh, actually the game doesn't actually i don't think the game actually credits the people that actually programmed it this says code God. produced by ocean so the boss he went uh we're not putting our names yeah. on this <laughs> Lucky. Uh, no, I think I think that was a that was a Nintendo stipulation that they didn't want the people who developed the game to have credits on there. That's very bizarre. But I think I think we sneakily put them in places in the graphics. Oh, I if you see. look hard, you might you might see initials and things dotted think all is, over. I but think I think there is actually in the first level. I think there is some visible, like sort of graffiti. Someone's put a name in. I think. Um, well, that, that was the only that was the only way we'd get our names on it. No, oh. not, not that I would want to. Have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but what what was the team? The amount of people that actually worked on the game was it like a was it a very limited amount of people? Or was it? It's only three. Only three people. So it was yeah. you you did the graphics and you got um, yeah. your friend uh, who did the, the code. And, yeah, and, and then uh, the did... other guy who did the backgrounds. What about the music as well? Who did the music? Oh yeah, the music as well. Yeah. Okay. So four. Four people, I mean, yeah. that's for that's a, for a Super Nintendo game. I mean, you think, I mean, when it came to like Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo, I mean, obviously the, the size of that production team would have been far greater, wouldn't it? Um, yes, it was. In fact, I actually did some stuff on that as well myself. So yeah, because I, I saw that, on that your, was done in CD. America. That was done in America, though, and we didn't really know much about what was going on there. Right, but I can just remember my my boss coming to me saying, "Look, you did the dinosaurs in the ST and Amiga one. The SNES one isn't looking up to scratch. Can you do the dinosaurs again?" Oh wow! <laughs> so I so I had to redraw them for the SNES. Oh my god! Well, I mean, I I, I own the Super Nintendo game. I thought it was very good. You no, know, graphically it was very good as well. I mean. I remember seeing it on TV being advertised on Bad Influence TV show and like talking about Jurassic Park and uh, oh yeah, he got good, he got good reviews and uh, so I mean yeah, it was, pretty, it was a pretty good game yeah. I mean because I cause that, there's all, there was a period I think really for Ocean where the quality sort of begin to sort of drop in terms of because Ocean were very much the ones for sort of movie licensed games. Obviously they did far you know did other games at like arcade ports and things like that. But I think there's a lot, some of the games like Lethal Weapon and like started to sort of dip in quality did you 
did you take any part in that game as well? That 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 was another one that I walked on, yeah. <laughs> and and that was also the same programmer, so that you probably find that the difficulty in lethal <sighs> weapons probably about the same as Robocop because it, it was the same guy that programmed it. Oh, he's oh, he's 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 like <laughs> he's angered at a whole generation, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that would make him very happy. <laughs> it would do, it would do. I'm the only one who can complete that game. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. But yes, I mean, with the game itself, I mean, when you got you got like five levels, and it's something I've always noticed with many movie license games, because generally, I mean, there was an interview one time with the guy from the guys who programmed Batman and Robin on the PlayStation, and they said the studio had paid so much for the license to program the game, to get you to sort of to get the license to make the game, they had no not much money left to actually make the game, yeah. so what you got was a very sort of you know very crappy sort of sandbox adventure game. Um, was this a sort of the case with some of Ocean's games, you know, where they'd sort of paid quite a lot to get the license to make the game, but didn't have enough money to really make something of quality and ended up sort of recycling the same game over and over again, but with different sprites, you know? No, I don't think so. I think it was... Well, I don't know about Lethal Weapon, because I only did one part of that game. Yeah. Um... As far as I know, it was it was it was designed and it was concepted by by the guys that worked on it, and they're all still in the industry now. Ah. Um, so I don't think it was a case of they didn't have enough money. They they did they had the right number of people on the team. Yeah, they had talented people on the team. Um, I think it was just the fact that they were. Well, maybe trying to translate a, a more sort of British style that they'd done on the eight bit graphics, yeah, over to like the SNES. Which, when you look at most SNES games, they've got like their own sort of style to them. They do, they do. And I think the stuff that we did was my uh, looked a bit old fashioned. Yeah. Maybe because we didn't play that many SNES games before we actually did them. Yes. I'd never played one. I'd not seen any games on the SNES. I was just given the console, and it was like, right, put that game in there. <laughs> if you look at if you look back at it now, do you think you know over what what you've learned over a number of years? You think the Super Nintendo was really easy to program for? If you look back now, or do you think when you saw at the time, you found it? You said you found it a bit of a struggle to get the, to get the grips with. Um, well, I don't know. You'd need to speak to the guy that pro guys that programmed it at that point. But I know that probably now, once I'd seen the sort of quality of the games that were out there at the time, yeah, we might have put a bit more effort in <laughs> 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 because there was, uh, like you were saying about uh, on the video about was it Robocop versus Terminator or yeah, something? Yeah. Did, did, mean, did, did you get a chance to play that game? Back in the day, no, I didn't even know it existed. Oh, it's it's, it's, a, it's so, a fantastic game on a Mega Drive. If I had if I had seen that, then it would have been right. We're going to do that, only we're going to do it better. Yeah, but, um, we just had, didn't have any experience of it, and I think we were basically re redrawing stuff that we might have done on the SNES or the Amstrad. Yeah, with. And I think the the, qual the quality could have been a lot better, but you know, it it was a license that we didn't really want to work on in the first place. Right. Well, why, <laughs> so, why, why, why was that? Why was that a license you didn't want to work on? Considering because you know, Robocop one and two has sort of done quite well for Ocean. We just we just come off the back of doing Batman movie. Okay. So that was a massive license, and then when we were given Another Robocop movie. three, yeah. it was about oh great. <laughs> the more pressure because the, the, the second one wasn't that good and we didn't yeah. from what we'd seen we didn't we suspected the third one was going to be a bit crap because he's got a jetpack it's not got the same actor in it no he's fighting ninjas so it was like <laughs> oh this is going to be crap <laughs> but luckily after that we got uh I got put onto Jurassic Park, so I think I sort of redeemed myself a bit after that. <laughs> I think you did, sir. I think you did. <laughs> uh, it's just a blip. It was a, just a dip in the in the line there. That's all that was. <laughs> I, th I think it's kind of thing where it's like you know, Robocop Three is you know I think obviously Ocean's first 
Super Nintendo game. Is that correct? Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Going from one platform to another, being a, a licensed game where people didn't, didn't want to work on it, and you've got limited team on it. And I think maybe if Robocop 3, what it is now, was, say, ported originally to the Amiga or Atari ST in that form, um, it probably really? wouldn't have been so, like, uh, it may have been a bit more, you know, moderately remembered by fans being, okay, yeah, it's an okay Robocop game. But because I think because it was on Super Nintendo and on top of the cost of the game, I think probably, you know, it probably came out in the shop for like £40 or £50, you know, back in well, the Well, this, this is the thing. Yeah. This is the thing, though, because um, your review of it yeah. is nothing compared to what the Americans think of it. Really? They fucking hate it. <laughs> in, f in fact... Ocean has got such a bad name in America because of the SNES thing, because of the, the quality of the SNES games. Oh, really? They, they, yeah, they really... In fact, there's, if you look on YouTube, there's a few reviews of... <coughs> it's either Lethal Weapon or Robocop 3, and they're going, yeah. oh, here's Ocean with another shit game, because that's all they can do is shit games. I was like, you should have been here in the 80s and exactly, early 90s, yeah. mate, because everything that came out of there was gold. Well, that's the thing, because a lot of these, you know, big popular video game websites, your game trailers or Screw Attack or things like that, or GameSpot, and they do, you know, they, they get um, interviewers or researchers who are far too young to know what the, who Ocean were and what yeah. to experience the 8-bit games or things like things from the 80s and they get them to do like a top 10 movie or top 10 worst movie games or something like that and they end up the same old games or not researching it properly or just slating one studio because of one game but yeah as yeah. you're saying if they were about during the day I mean, Ocean were like you know really big in the UK I mean there's not the stuff I remember I always generally thought Ocean made some quality products obviously there were some stinkers along the way but everyone does those but they were very big in Europe, actually, not just the UK. They were massive in Europe. Oh, really? Ah. Yeah. Because you got, you know, I think Cobra. Places like Cobra France really well. and Spain and even Russia, they were big there as well. Ah. Well, there you go. I mean, they, they, they've, they're they basing Ocean on one or two games and sort of labelling them as a bad video games uh, publisher, you know, uh, which, is, yeah. which, is, which is far from it, really. But yeah, you know, Rob but actually the weird thing is Robocop 3 was ported to the Mega Drive. I don't think it was actually handled by you guys, was it? I have no idea. Because the weird no, thing is... I think, I think it was, I think it <clears throat> may, was it supposed to be ported to the Game Gear as well? There was a Game Gear port and the Mega Drive. They were done by Flying Edge. But I think they, they're sort of UK based sort of LJN, I think, possibly. Um, I think owned by Acclaim, I think. And they, um, but they did a port of Robocop three of of your of this of the ocean code, but they sort yeah. of changed some of the graphics. They made Robocop a lot more slimmer, and they added um, an option screen <laughs> with uh, where you can increase the lives and continue. So they obviously knew the game was a notoriously hard, Too hard. and they gave people <laughs> yeah. lives and continues, which was quite handy. The width and when you die. You don't get sent back to the beginning of the game. You get sent well to begin, beginning of the level. You get sent back. To, there's these automatic save points within each level. So because mm. when I, we, me and my friend Richard were playing it, we get to the end of like of like the rocket pack level. We forgot to save it, so we've got to go all the way back. But that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of emulation because I would have never seen the final level because I could save it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's the thing, you know, that's the, the handy of emulation. Um, you know, with Ocean, I mean, after you finished with them, did you, wh why did you decide to leave Ocean? Did you get offered a better job somewhere else? Um, well, the, the main guy who, who was there who basically offered me the job was uh, Gary Bracey. Mm -hmm. And he was a big, he was a big film buff and he was like into movies and all that sort of thing. And he was the one that, got all the movie licenses for these great games. Yeah. Um, and then he decided to move on. Um, and at that point, we had... Um, we'd expanded too much, I think, the problem was. We'd moved into a bigger building. We'd taken on a load of people. Um, we'd also bought a load of SGI machines. SGI? Um yeah, oh, the silicon graphic things, is it? The, yeah, yeah, the yeah those, um, 
with uh, copies of what would it have been Alias or Wavefront, right. the three D uh, mm. package. Yeah. So we had some of them. We'd they'd spent so much money, and uh, nothing was being done. Apparently, the, there was um, there was a game that was there might have been a couple of games that had been uh, in production for well over a year and yeah. never saw the light of day. I mean, looking at the sort of uh, the games they'd published in the sort of the nineties, have sort of dropped quite sharply. I think, uh, yeah, it was it was to do, it was probably to do with the money that was being spent on it, and but p- people were just like taking the piss, really. Yeah, I mean, if if, if we had spent an hour on, on an hour, <laughs> a year on a game, you know, you'd be thinking, right, where is it? Where's the fucking game? Yeah, but all all they had was was some rendered graphics that somebody had put together. Really, um, oh, funny. So there was there was no game there at all. So by this time, Gary had decided that he'd had enough and and left. Just just went. Yeah. Um, and a few other people had left because they'd had um, better offers and went to America. Um, so I uh, decided it was time to go at that point because everybody was going on and it didn't look like the uh, the prospects were looking too good there at the time. Yeah. Because Ocean sort of came to an end in the late nineties, and I think the last game they did was, I think Mission Impossible, um, for Nintendo sixty four. That probably wasn't that probably wasn't even done in house, as far as I as far as I know, because the last thing I was working on was um, Jurassic Part Two. Jurassic Part Two. Start, yeah, I started that. I think I did. You know, it was a sort of side scrolling thing, wasn't it? Was was that for the what for the Super Nintendo or the Mega Drive? On the yeah, it would have been on the stash, yeah. So I think before I left, I I had um, animated the little guy running left and right with his gun. That that was about that was about my input of that game. Because <laughs> after you sort of left there, I mean, was it Ocean, Ocean sort of? When was that? It must be like ninety five. No, yeah, either night, yeah, around that. I think. Yeah, can't remember off the top of my head. Who are you now working for then? At the moment, yeah. I'm um, well. I did a few years on doing contract work. So, um, where did I work? I worked for Sumo Digital in Sheffield. Oh wow! They've all they've all for some so, reason, they're always advertising jobs there, but for things like also, video editing jobs, but they require too many. Uh, like you require to uh, basically they expect you to know everything <laughs> if you want to yeah, work there. Yeah. I worked on the first, um, the Sonic racing game, the first one on the SNES, not on the SNES, what am I talking about, on the, um, <laughs> on the DS. On the DS, oh wow. Um, and then after that, um, I went down to Cambridge and worked on RuneScape for three months. Did you work for Jagax thing, did you? Yeah. I, I, uh, I, then, I worked there for a bit. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Basically, I got because um, I'm obviously I'm, ba- I'm based in Cambridge, so they see just down the road from me, mm. and um, I worked in like customer support for like three months. Oh, in the building across the road. Yeah, yeah. Basically, cause it's all it's like. Well, I think when you worked there, they'd they'd they would, uh, they'd all. I think well, when I worked there, they'd moved to the science park. Yeah, that's where that's where they were when I was were, was there. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's this giant tank outside. I think the owner of Jack yeah. bought his tank and stuff. And uh, with yeah, I worked in customer support, so I had to commun- had to communicate with all the nerdy sort of players and complaining about their <laughs> accounts being hacked because they spoke to someone and said, "Oh, you can collect so many coins or whatever." And they click on it and then they go to like a malware site and this key chains, the key logs their fucking account, and then they boom, you know, everything's gone. You know, there's so many. We might have been there at the same time then, possibly. That, I worked. I was there uh, about a year ago, so... Oh, a year now, I've gone by that Yeah, point. yeah, so I mean, it's really weird with Jagex, there's always people coming and going, no one ever really stayed there for long periods of time, apart from, like, people upstairs, like some of the animators and programmers have been there since the beginning. So, where, so where are you working, are you still contracting with Sega, or are you sort of um, doing bits um, and bobs on the side? No, I did, I did another thing for Sega, which was that Nike, Nike Plus training Really? So that was back at Sumo in Sheffield, and then I left there 
but it was only like a three month contract or four month contract and now I'm in Manchester uh, working with a company called Yippie Entertainment oh, never, um, never heard of them they sort the, of uh, mobile device sort of games. It's it's iPhone. iPhone, okay. So they they did a game called Chimpact. Oh. Which is uh, it's a sort of monkey arcadey sort of game, which looks very much like um, Donkey Kong Country a little bit. Oh. Really nice looking game. So um, I've been I've been there a year now, so that's, oh wow! Uh, so it's actually a proper contract you've got with them then. So will they keep extending uh, it's, you? <laughs> it's full time. Oh I wow! Mean, uh, the number of full time jobs is quite low, so I've been I've that's managed good. to bag one. Well done, sir. Well done. The weird, yeah. The weird thing is actually with a lot of these uh, mobile mobile games becoming very popular again. A lot of the old programmers from back in the day are sort of getting more work because these games are sort of best suited. But for some a lot of the games are quite two D animation things like that and programming. So there's been a sort of uh, well, yeah. I mean, the the two two in fact, all of the people that are in the company have been in the have been in the industry for over twenty years. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so they're, they're all from soft well, either software creations, which was also in Manchester. Um, there's a couple from Ocean as well. So uh, they're all they've all they're all veterans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Speak, yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, got the, the pool of talent in in UK is still you know going around in the circle, getting more work, which is always good. You know. Yeah, and one of my friends, uh, Jim Bagley, who used to work at Special Effects, he did some stuff on the Spectrum and stuff like that, and he's just done a an, an iOS game called Apple Dash. All oh, right. And it, if you wanted to play a game that is completely retro, <laughs> it, <laughs> uh, but looks really, really gorgeous, it's it's that. It's it's such a great little game. It, it reminds me so much of um, oh, what is it? It's like um, Bomb Jack. All the old programmers are still there in one form or another. I mean, have you thought about doing the sort of indie scene with the XBLA sort of? Server or you know, all the Xbox One or PS4 are going to be sort of well, PS4 it's is going to be. Finding, it's just finding somebody to code. I can't code, I've got absolutely no idea. I've, I've, I've had trouble counting, never mind coding. So, <laughs> the only thing I can do it's is the like the, the bit of games design and the, uh, and the graphics, really. <laughs> Have you thought about... Have you thought maybe about maybe doing... if there's somebody out there who's watching this video, they could, uh, if they want to code Robocop 3, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a proper version of it, and then hopefully everybody in America will shut the fuck up. Exactly. But, Bill, you've got to watch the film first. <laughs> That's the hurdle you've got, you've got to do. You've got to cross. Watch the film. <laughs> yeah. Well... Maybe a half to do. <laughs> maybe a half to, but a few drinks will uh, persuade you, I think. <laughs> yeah, I won't, hopefully I won't remember it after I've watched it. <laughs> With Robocop 3, you didn't take part in the Amiga and ST versions, did you? Did you get a chance to play with those? Um, was that the 3D one? It was, yeah. Uh, no, I do remember seeing it at yeah. the time. I remember seeing demos of it appearing every month or so. Because that, but no, I didn't really have much to do with it. Well, because that game itself, you know, with with all the sort of you know failed sort of Robocop games based on number three, you know there was that was the only one I think that really got some critical acclaim. I think actually because it was doing something different with the Atari ST and Amiga, which probably some people probably saw only on the IBM PCs at the time. Yeah, I, it was pretty obvious that 3D was going to be the way to go. It's just that's uh, right. Yeah. We, the, the computers just couldn't handle it at that time. Yeah. So everything looked a bit crap. But <laughs> it did seem because even when I was when I was there working on like two D stuff. Yeah. I did have a copy of a like a three D modeling software, and I was learning that um, in my spare time because I just thought, no, this 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 is going to be it. Everything's going to all the graphics and stuff are going to be in three D. So I'm going to have to learn this. Yeah. I mean, so, was every every sort of you know platform you worked on, did you have to learn everything from scratch again? Did you have to go on training courses to sort of get these 
you know, to learn how to sort of program the graphics? Um, no, everything was pretty much just, um, I just, I just learnt it by myself. I mean, when it, when I actually did my first 3D game, yeah. um, I had been using the software for a while, um, so it was, like, it was just a, it was just a very long learning process and the, my whole career has just been a learning process. I'm still learning stuff now. Yeah, because you, you're, you know, developing stuff for different platforms, like you've got DS and you've got mobile phone devices as well. Yeah, so it, it never stops. You're always coming up with some new way of doing stuff and then, um, well, I'd been doing 3D stuff for quite a while, and then I took I took a couple of years out because yeah. I was like uh, I, I, was sort of, I was like bringing up like looking after my son for a while, so I I, I had to take I, I took three years out, maybe two, maybe three years, and then when I tried to get back into the industry, it was so hard. Yeah, I can imagine because everything's changed. Because everything, isn't it? everything had moved on so much. So basically, I had to go back in at the start again. I started. Uh, I got a job with a company where I was, um, which was for like old Nokia mobile phones. Yeah. So I was doing stuff like um, Sonic the Hedgehog for Sega. Really? Oh, so, which mobile phone was this for? Was it like a sort of Engage or something? <laughs> Uh, no, more for like a high-end Nokia in about 1990, uh, about 2006 or seven. Oh right, because you so, cause did you did you because on your on your credits games credits, I mean you worked on Worms, wasn't it in 2007? Is that yeah, yeah. There was there was one where um, the the phone was so. This is way before iPhone, so yeah. You had so many phones that you had to make sure that your game was compatible with. It was an absolute nightmare. I can imagine. Yeah. So there was there was this, there was one particular phone that could have three D. So you had the sort of worms and all the thing going on in the in the foreground, and then the background you would have like three D objects sort of bobbing around. And I remember building a ship or something, <laughs> possibly. It sort of floated around. The mobile phones just started to be able to use 3D. So I think I, I worked on um, a Moto GP oh, 3D right. game on a on on a mobile as well. Oh. But then obviously you know the the iPhone came in and everything changed. And it did. All, you of know, these, you can get like... all of these devices just disappeared. It's madness because you know once that iPhone came about, you know, and a couple of years later, my friend was like, you know, he's playing. Grand Theft Auto 3 on his phone. I was like, what? Yeah. This is madness. Even though it's an absolute ass to completely control. But, you know, yes. you, you get like Street Fighter 4 on the iPhone. Like, oh, you can't even imagine playing it on the iPhone. It'd be impossible. Um, but they did, they, they still convert it. You know, people will still pay for it, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, they will. From all the games you've made, you've worked on, sorry, and what's, the, what's mm. the one game you're most proud of? In terms of the graphics you've you've managed to achieve, so there's there's a few that I'm happy with. Obviously, I'm I'm happy with um, Batman in the movie because it was such a big deal and it it looked really nice and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, Chase HQ because it was so well received and everybody loved that game. Um, recently, j just just for my own sort of satisfaction is I'd, I'd worked on some animation for this Nike, Nike Plus training where I had to animate a, a, like a high uh, polygon model of like your trainer. Oh, right. Um, because he tells you what to do, how to do your that. It's basically a training. He's like a personal trainer, so he tells you what to do. Yeah. Um, so at some point I had to, m most of the game was motion captured. Really? But sometimes, okay. motion, motion, sometimes the motion capture didn't work. Yeah, and and there was times where I had to hand animate this guy moving around and doing moves, and they had to be so precise that they had to look like they were motion captured. Cool. So I, I I think for my own satisfaction, that's another that's another one that I'm I'm really happy with. 
Oh wow, fantastic! Oh, that's good. That's what it's like. You know, it's your newest stuff you're most proud of. So you've obviously over the years you've you know your skills have probably gone up ten tenfold. Do you think since then, since the since the beginning? Oh god, yeah, yeah. It's it's insane the amount of stuff that you sort of. I, I, I've got. I'm in a sort of weird sort of situation where I've, I've been there at the beginning, where yeah. it's been plotting pixels down, and now I'm sort of like building polygons. But occasionally, <laughs> occasionally you still need somebody that can plot a pixel down and do like pixel animation. So yeah. I'm, I'm. I suppose I'm lucky in a way that I've I've got the ability to do yeah. both. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Bill, thank you very much for your time. You provide me some excellent information and insight into the gaming world and your sort of career at Ocean and now, which is fantastic. No problem. It's been a good laugh, actually. Yeah, I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, good. Have a uh, good evening and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. You too. Thanks a lot. Okay, matey. Goodbye.